Valentine's Day. Listen, I have Catholic friends are going crazy. Listen, it's Mardi Gras Tuesday, Valentine's Day, and Ash Wednesday, Wednesday, and Easter and a April Fool's Day is on the same day too. Kind of throws you uh, a spin for the beginning of the year, you know, all these things at one time. Today we talk about learning to love and be loved. Uh, that's an issue that I deal with and other pastors deal with and counselors uh, in, in relationships and people going through things in marriages and uh, to understand that people go through things in life and it, it, it mars everything that they look forward into their relationship. Some just don't know how to love and some don't know how to receive love from others. The, there was this pet store guy going down the road in his, in his truck and he'd get to a red light and he would jump out on the side and go to the back of it and beat the, the side of the, the, the box in the back with a two by four and he'd jump back in the truck and go off to the next red light. Next red light he'd jump out and come back behind the truck and beat the side of the truck, get back in the tr truck and run to the next red light. The guy behind him was getting tired of this after four or five red lights, and he pulled up beside him, put his window down, and said, Man, what are you doing? Every red light you stop and go out behind the, the, your truck and beat the side of your truck with that board. The guy says, Listen, man, this is a two-ton truck. I have four tons of canary in the back, and I have to keep half of them flying all the time. Sometimes our lives are like that. We're just trying to juggle everything. And when we try to juggle everything, it's amazing that one day all those things will come crashing down on us. So we try to control people. We try to control situations. We try to control circumstances. All of these things so that we perceive that we are happy. We're really living in fear. There's so many things that prohibit us from truly living out a fulfilling, healthy relationship with our spouse. When we try to control, we try to keep beating the side of the, uh, of the box to keep everything moving so it doesn't all come around us. Today we learn one of the very basic things that we need to in our marriage is learning how to love. And our love that we have for others is based off of God's love for us. This is the core. Listen, I'm not trying to give you marriage principles or anything today, I'm wanting us to get to the very core of our relationship. And that's God's love being poured out into us so that we can pour it out to others. If you have your Bibles, turn with it to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John. Mother Teresa said it this way. said, love is a fruit in season at all times and within reach of every hand. Love is a fruit of that stays in season at all times. Problem is that some of us don't know how to pick it. Healthy love. God's plan is for you to have a healthy love. Being complete in mind, body, and spirit. Healthy love is this. It's passion, which is eros, is erotic love. But it's also intimacy, which is philos, or affection, and it's also commitment, or agape, or spiritual love. Those all three must come together for us to truly experience the kind of love that God wants us to have in our relationship. John tells us about God's love. Understanding more about God's love helps us to develop a greater love and a purer love inside of our relationship. John writes this, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent one, his one and only Son, into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. 
But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit, and we have sent, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in him. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Let's pray together. Father God, today as we hear this passage and read this passage together, Lord, we know that you love us. God, sometimes we just don't know how to express that same love to you or to others. God, oftentimes in our marriage, our relationships, we struggle. We get so consumed by juggling life, juggling our problems, juggling our past. God, that we never try, truly find freedom that we can put our guard down to love our spouse like we should. Teach us today, God, through your word, through this message, by your power, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. As a pastor, I've learned this. Not every message will apply to every person. Sometimes you preach a message and it's just one person out there that, that grabs something out of that and says, the Lord spoke to me about this. This message may be that for you. It may be that one thing that you needed to hear to get you a little further down the line, to help you out, to figure a few things out in your relationship, in your marriage. So we begin this message. We see several things that God begins to point out to help us along in our relationship. The first is this is that we should have unconditional love. And that unconditional love flows from God. See, our lives are being transformed by God's unconditional love, springing forth in divine favor to our souls. We see in verse 7 and verse 8, My dear friends, we must love each other. And love comes from God. And we love, and when we love one another, it shows that we have been given new life. And we are now God's children. And we know him. And God is love. And anyone who doesn't love others has never known him. See, John reminds the church that genuine love is always defined and founded in the love that God has for us, that he sent to us in his son, Christ Jesus. Any love exerted through human emotions or human efforts apart from God will always be founded in selfishness. Listen, if we try to love our spouse in our own power, it will always end up being selfish. You remember last week we talked about when God is not in control in our life, who is? We are. And when we are in control, that old nature wants to come back up and get very selfish and lead us down paths that God never intended for us. Listen, in our relationship, when we are in control, we get very selfish. When we do not allow God to live through us, we get selfish. And it doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian. We begin to act out very selfishly. And selfishness never looks out for the other person. It always looks out for number one. Always looks out for our own best interest. What I want, you need to give to me. I want it and I want it now when I want it. That's that selfishness. And we'll, we'll put demands and control, try to control other people to give us what we want, and it's all out of selfishness. And sadly, about 50% of Christian marriages suffer from this selfish mindset. Many couples approach marriage asking, you know, what can this marriage do for me rather than what can I contribute to it? A selfish mentality does not acknowledge 
or thrive in unconditional love. See, selfishness is always connected with conditions in a relationship. It says this. It says, I will be with you as long as you... And there's a blank. Then some conditional request is tagged to this contract of relationship. I'll be with you and I'll love you as long as you do these things for me. As long as you meet these needs and these wants and these desires. Yet God loves us unconditionally. Can we approach our relationship with this unconditional love? Now listen, unconditional love is not this. You should never allow your spouse to step all over you. I'm going to repeat that. You should never allow your spouse to step all over you. You should never tolerate physical abuse, mental and emotional abuse. There is help for that. If your husband is beating on you, lady, you need to get out of that situation. You need to distance yourself from that. Allow God to do some healing in you and to see if there's something left to restore. If there's been infidelity, listen, biblical means gives us, you need to step away from that for a little while and allow yourself to heal. You, unconditional love is not telling you to tolerate anything and everything. You love. You love them unconditionally. But sometimes you need to take, take a step back. And reevaluate some things. Allow God's grace to come into your life, come into that life, and come into that situation. Selfish mentality does not acknowledge or thrive in that unconditional love. God loves us unconditionally. He loves us he, even when we act unlovingly. God does not drop us or divorce himself from us because we disappointed him. God demonstrates unconditional and unselfish love and he pours his love into our souls to free us to pour that love into others. Isn't that wonderful when God, when we accept God's unconditional love and he changes us and transforms us and we're living for him and we're approaching our life not with a selfish mentality but with God in control. And with God in control, we'll always look out for the best interests of other people and we'll always look out where God is wanting to to lead us. God's concept of love. We accept his concept of love and accept his love into our lives so that we can permanently fix his agape love, that, that spiritual love as our foundation, as our measuring mark of how we love others. We have to accept what God has done for us in our relationship. God, with, with our relationship with him, when we are in right standing with him, he's in control. It's amazing the transformation that it makes in our marriage, in our relationship. It can change everything when we know that we're doing our part in right relationship with God. Eric Fromm said this. He said, love means to commit oneself without guarantee. To give oneself completely in the hope that our love will produce love in the other person. Love is an act of faith. And whoever is of little faith is also of little love. So we see this unconditional love. That, that as we approach our marriage, we approach, we approach our relationships, that we approach them with this unconditional love that God is going to do something great and he's going to do it through us. He's going to do it in them and we're going to come together. Listen, this is not a quick fix thing. This is a daily surrendering ourselves over to God that he is in control. The second thing we see is that love is a choice of the will. So that we need to have God's unconditional love poured onto us so that we can pour it into others but love is also a choice of the will. See, true love is an act of the will which cannot be manipulated or coerced. It must flow freely from one person to another who willingly receives its transforming power. Verse 9 tells us this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. God showed us what his unconditional love looked like. Jesus went to the cross by choice of his will and showed you love and me love, and we didn't deserve it. We deserved hell. 
We deserve to pay the consequences for the sin in our life. But God saw us, and he had mercy on us. He had grace upon us. And it's amazing when he died, when Christ died on the cross, he didn't say, I died for just a few of you. He said, I died for all of you. He didn't say, I'll die if you be good enough. He said, I'll die as you are in your sin. That we were... When we were still in our sin, Jesus died for us. It was a choice of his will to love us. And it's a choice of our will to love other people. It can't, listen, no one can coerce you or manipulate you to love them. God demonstrated his love in a tangible way. Tangible way. When Jesus died on the cross... Jesus' selfless example of love and compassion was a choice of his will. Love is a conscious choice of our will for others. Love moves beyond a thought or a feeling or an obligation. It moves beyond that. True love is the action of investing ourselves in another person without reservation. Couples come to me and want to be married. I do marriage classes. One of the things that we, we have to cover and we, we have to get this understanding of is that we are to love our spouse without reservation. Part of their vow says this, that you love enough to risk being hurt. See, there's no guarantee in marriage. There's no guarantee when you, when you put yourself out there, you open yourself up to, to love someone else that they're going to receive it in a healthy way. That they would even receive it all. You don't know what the person has been through in all their life, and it may be a brick wall. They have feelings for you. They love you, but they're not in love with you. Big difference. There's no guarantee that someone else that you send your love out to will respond in a way that will meet you in the middle. To claim that we love another person, yet we put reservations on that person, is not true love. We must be like Christ, be wise to love others without a guarantee of ever receiving the same or better love in return. When we say I do, we put those rings on, there's always a risk that our spouse will disappoint us. That's where unconditional love comes back in. There's always this risk that we're going to be let down. But listen, you still, by choice of your will, say, I do for the rest of my life. I will with you. Today, we like guarantees. We like a warranty. But marriage has no warranty. Relationships has no guarantee. Oftentimes, We get rejected. Oftentimes, we get disappointed. But only through the love of God can we invest genuine love in another person with the intent of pouring 100% of ourselves into that relationship without a guarantee. Only because God loves us and God is in control over us can we honestly stick our neck out there, so to speak, in a relationship and say, I'm going to love you I'm going to pour my my love. I'm I'm going to treat you as best as I can and pour that love out with no guarantee. That's how Jesus did it on the cross. He went there by an act of his will with no guarantee that one single person in all the world would ever say yes to him. He just kept loving. He keeps loving, keeps loving, and keeps loving, keeps giving unconditionally, knowing that there were people who will respond to him. In our relationship, we are like Christ in so many ways that we have to unconditionally, by choice of our will, pour love into other people, especially into our spouse, and to see what God can do in their life and to, into our connection with them. True love is an act of your will. The third thing we see is the gift of grace. Giving the gift of grace to yourself and to others. You want to You want a healthy marriage? Be sure it is saturated with grace and saturated with forgiveness because you'll use that pretty much every day. At least Anita does anyway. (laughs) Grace 
is an attitude of the heart and an act of the will in which we a person which a person's wrongs are released to God's control for his sovereign favor and justice. We see in verse 10, it says, Real love isn't love, our love for God, but his love for us. God sent his son to us to be the sacrifice by which our sins are forgiven. God demonstrates his grace to us in Christ. He loves us even through we are acting unlovingly. Even when we are acting unlovingly, God still loves us and gives us grace and gives us favor. Still, he pours on into us, hoping that through him pouring into us, that we will, we will mature in our faith and pour that same love into other people. That we're, we become that conduit of God's love to our spouse, to our husband, to our wife. See, we must only, we must truly understand how God's grace and forgiveness cleanses our soul and heals our wounds and our lives caused by others as well as ourselves. Let's just be honest. We're all in recovery from something. We're all in recovery from something. To say that you're not is a denial. We're not saying you're in recovery for alcoholism or drug abuse or anything. But listen, someone has hurt you along the way. Whether you were very small and it's, it, it's framed way back in, into your mind and, and something happens and it triggers it, it's there. We're living in a sin-cursed world and, and we, we rub, you know, friction with other people. There may have been teachers who said things to you when you, when you were in school that was not appropriate. Your parents may have said things to you, compared you to a, to a sibling. Friends and neighbors may have compared you to someone. They may have said things to you that you weren't pretty, that you, that you were ugly, that you were overweight, that you were this, you were that. All those things wound us. And you'll be amazed at how many decisions in your life that you make will be based on what someone told you 15, 20 years ago. Because it wounded you and you never healed from that. So that wound is always affecting everything that you do. And when that wound is deep enough, we go into our relationship, we carry all that baggage with us. We need grace from our spouse. We need grace for them to, to not only unconditionally love us, to accept us for who we are, but also to love us beyond where we've been and what has happened to us. You see, God wants, God wants into our life to heal those past to, so they're no longer wounds, that they're scars. Scars have lessons. Wounds don't. Wounds keep affecting us to make our decision, the wrong decisions in the future. And there are many, many couples today who go into a marriage relationship so wounded they do not know how to accept love from their spouse. And there are many who don't know how to give love. They have such a wall up that they'll let their spouse up to a certain limit, to a certain place, and that's it. The wall goes up. Two, three years down the road, after they've tried and tried, problems begin to erupt. Situations begin to arise. And most will not reach out for help until it's too late. Until they've given up and thrown their hands up in the air. So I can't do this anymore. Oh, listen today. Yes, you can. If you're here this morning and you're one of those people who are suffering from a past like we all are, and it's affecting your decisions, and those decisions are affecting your marriage, you need to reach out. It's time for healing. It's not time to bury it. It's not time to put it. You know what happens? We usually, the old, the old slogan, we sweep it under the rug. You know what happens after we sweep things under the rug too much? We still have to walk across the rug, and we start stumbling over it. All that stuff that we've just swept under is still there. And God wants us to do a clean, 
a cleansing to, to wipe all that, those things out, to heal those wounds so it's no longer wounds or scars and there's lessons to be learned that we can apply to our relationship and our relationship can be healthy, our relationship can be whole and it's amazing the things that God will do in us and through us. Maybe you're just dealing with a past. Maybe you're just, you don't know how to go. Maybe you just you want to keep quiet, don't let anybody know. You know, we just kinda, we're just kind of coasting along in our relationship. And God says, I want more for you than that. I want so much more for you than that. Do you know how to really love someone? Do you know how to love them and give them grace? Listen, this morning, give yourself some grace. You made mistakes. You've said and done the wrong things in the past. God is here with open arms saying, I'll forgive you. Just give it to me. Quit carrying that burden so long. Quit trying to, quit trying to do life with it. I died on the cross to set you free from all of that. Would you this morning give it to Christ? Totally. Quit carrying that along. Let him heal that. And when you are healed and you're filled with, with the presence of God, your relationship will begin to reflect it. That old hardened heart that you've been carrying along, only letting your spouse get so close, only not, not really allowing him to see everything in you, not really letting him or her get to know you, those walls can be broken down with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. There's no reason that Christian marriages should be suffer, suffering when we have all we need in Christ. All we need in Christ. If we would only allow him to be in control. It's amazing what God wants to do in our life. Robert Mueller said this. He says, to forgive is the highest, most beautiful form of love. In return, you will receive untold peace and happiness. Can you forgive someone else who has hurt you in your life? Can you, can you just say today, I'm tired of holding against that person. I remember what he said to me. I remember what she did. I remember this or that. I remember all those things. But God, today is beyond me. I can't control it. Would you take over, Lord? I forgive them. Listen, forgiveness is always a choice. Always act of your will. Forgiveness is a choice. You may say, well, I don't feel like forgiving them. Don't worry about your feelings. Forgiveness is a choice. Your feelings will catch up sometime later. It may be a year from now, six months from now, whatever. Your feelings will catch up. You make a decision through the power of God because God commands you to forgive and release yourself from it. Believe me, unforgiveness only holds you hostage, not the other person. They're living their life and they're doing whatever. But you're the one carrying the load. Can you forgive? Give grace to yourself. Give grace to others and grace to your spouse. Listen, your spouse will not always get it right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, To love. Don't keep a record of wrongs. Don't be easily angered. Keep no records of wrongs. You know what that means? Is that we shouldn't fly off the handle every time our spouse doesn't get it right. She burnt the rice, cook some more. Oh, I was poor. If we burnt the rice, you just ate it off the top. That's all. He didn't haul out the garbage. Don't, don't tell him all the times he's messed up and didn't fix his stuff around the house and do the. Just tell him to pick the garbage up. See, there, you don't have to have a come to Jesus meeting every time something a little small comes up. You work together in this sense of grace and forgiveness and allow your relationship to, to grow and to, to mend and to, to grow deeper. You should be deeper in love today than you were the first day that you met. Far deeper. Ephesians chapter 
4, verse 31 and 32 says, Stop being bitter and angry and mad at others. Don't yell at one another or curse each other or be, ever be rude. Instead, be kind and merciful. Forgive others just as God forgave you because of Christ. We're all capable of doing things wrong, but we're also capable of forgiving one another. We're also capable of moving on beyond our past. I like that old, that old picture. If you think about when you're driving home, you have your windshield in front and there's a little small rearview mirror. Why is the rearview mirror so small? Because it's less important what's behind you than what's in front of you. It's where you're going that's more concerned than where you've been. Paul Bowes said this, said, uh, forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. Lewis Smead said it this way, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. So what do you need to forgive yourself for this morning? What do you need to forgive someone else for? Maybe you need to ask forgiveness from someone. The fourth thing is this. We need to follow God's example. We don't want our marriages to be happy, healthy, and flourishing. Then we need to follow God's example of how he pours love into us. We see that John chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we are to love one another. It's very simple. We're to follow God's example. God's example is very clear to us that when he died, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross. He keeps after us. He pursues us and pursues us. Why? Because he loves us so much, he wants to change our life. Do you love your spouse enough to pursue them so that your relationship, you do everything that you possibly can to make your relationship as happy and as whole in the power of God. God flowing in your life and you pouring it into your relationship, pouring it into the one you love. Listen, no guarantees, no guarantee they're going to respond in an equal manner. But you'll always know that you're doing your part and God is being honored through you in your relationship. And let's just see what God will do. Let's just see what God will do by you being faithful. Let's pray together. Father God, today, Lord, I thank you that you teach us how to love one another. As imperfect as we are, Lord, you still use us. God, you created marriage. You created relationships between a man and a woman. And you want us to be healthy and happy and whole your way, Father not our way. And God, I pray for your people today. There's no quick fix. Father, there's just some core basic foundational things that we need to understand about love that you show us, that you give to us. Help us, Lord, to love one another. Help us to love our spouse the way that you love us. Let us be conduits of your grace, your mercy. Things don't go right, God, that we don't just give up and throw the towel in, Father, that we continue to work together as best as possible. And, Father, I pray that you just be with your people. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us in our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen. Our staff is here this morning, Pastor Brian and Michaela and Sarah. They're here for you. Maybe you need to pray. Maybe God is leading you to do something in your life. and You just need to open up and talk with someone. God is doing some great things in our marriages and our relationships. Wednesday is Valentine's Day. Can it be a day that you truly give everything to Christ?